Hello friends, um, I teach sociology in Delhi University. My name is Nandini Sundar and recently uh, we've had uh, a withdrawal of a text by Mahashweta Devi uh, called Draupadi from the English uh, department syllabus. And um, one of the reasons given for this withdrawal was that it would hurt the sentiments of uh, students who came in. Now, one of the things I've seen um, over the years, last 20 years of teaching, is that we have very few Adivasi students uh, coming from Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha. Um, and one of these days, what I would like to see is that when the university administration talks of the hurt feelings of students, they also refer to the hurt feelings of Adivasi students. Because the assumption right now is that these are not the kind of people who are going to come to places like DU. That DU is only going to be for upper caste students from North India. So the first thing I would like to do in my reimagined India is have universities where there are students from all parts of the country, uh, students from outside the country as well. And uh, we don't have this kind of upper caste, upper class domination of the universities that we see now. So for that, the first thing that we need really is education in all the Adivasi areas of this country, a good primary education uh, which is not, you know, shortchanging students in terms of their own identities and on the other hand, shortchanging them in terms of uh, the kind of primary education that uh, is provided by, you know, good public schools or by expensive private schools. Let me just step back a bit and talk about how when the constitution was framed, uh, there were many, many representations by uh, Adivasi groups, scheduled tribes, uh, at that time they were not called scheduled tribes, that terminology came in with the constitution, by different groups asking for uh, representation in the committees that framed the fifth and sixth schedules, talking about their vision of um, India. The Adivasi leader Jaipal Singh pointed out that Adivasis have been the most democratic people uh, in the country and that when India was moving towards democracy, uh, they should actually learn from Adivasis what this means and uh, how to practice it. At the time when the constitution was being framed, these Adivasi groups, both from the Northeast, from Maharashtra, from Jharkhand, uh, from you know all the different areas where there are Adivasis, uh, made several representations. Some of them were concerned with um, questions like proportional representation so that smaller communities could be represented better. But many were asking for better educational facilities. Many of them were asking for um, you know, recognition of their languages, uh, recognition of their identity in a way that would be part of a larger democratic enterprise. Again, one of the things that people were asking for uh, was protection from land alienation and the right to control their own resources, control their own destinies. At the time that uh, the committees to frame the fifth and sixth schedules were framing their uh, you know, draft reports. The decision had been that there would be a tribes advisory council which would take up issues that were important to Adivasis um, and refer them to the legislature of the state, refer them to the governor for discussion. In the end, in the constituent assembly, uh, the matter was completely changed around and the tribes advisory councils could only take up issues that were referred to them by the governor. So that's the way we have it in the fifth schedule which deals with all the areas which are inhabited uh, predominantly by Adivasis that you have a tribes advisory council but they can only deliberate on issues that are referred to them by the governor. And we know that the governor is a political appointee. 
In fact, even at the time the constitution was being framed, uh, it was quite clear that the governor was simply an agent of the center and was not going to be an independent functionary who could resist on behalf of the tribes. One of the arguments that K.M. Munshi uh, made uh, against the Tribes Advisory Council having this independent role was that then every little Adivasi uh, unit would be free to decide their own fate. And he says, what do the Adivasis know about administration? What do they know about law and order? What do they know about money lending? And therefore, we cannot give them this power. But the vision that Jaipal Singh uh, and others had at that time was precisely this, that the best people to know about their situation are the people who are experiencing it, that Adivasis are more expert in money lending and, uh, you know, because they've suffered the effects of it and would know uh, what to do about it, that they should be consulted uh, when anything is done with their resources and with their land. So this idea of an autonomous self-governing unit um, which was put into cold storage by uh, the Constituent Assembly uh, in the making of the fifth schedule um, had to some extent been revived uh, when the Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act was drafted. Uh, and passed in 1996, under which the permission of the Gram Sabha has to be consulted uh, if its land is being used for any project. It has to be consulted if there is minor mining on their land um, and for a variety of other uses uh, they have of the area, the resources, uh, the Gram Sabha must be consulted. Now, in principle, this is something that should actually apply to all communities in this country because democracy really begins at the ground level where people are able to understand what's happening to them at an immediate level and they should be able to govern themselves um, in consultation of course with the laws of the country and with uh, administrations up the ladder. But across the country right now we see Adivasi groups fighting for precisely this principle that they should be the ones who are deciding their own future when it comes to their own lands, their own uh, resources. And the Pathalgadi movement in Jharkhand where people have put up, uh, you know, stones um, with the provisions of the constitution inscribed on it um, is really a demand to follow this constitutional principle that uh, Gram Sabhas should have autonomy. Similarly, uh, you have struggles all over the country against um, their sacred spaces being taken over by security camps or by development, so-called development projects of different kinds. And people are struggling to say that, you know, if you're going to establish a CRPF camp on our land, as in Silgair, where young people are waging um, a very non-violent, peaceful uh, struggle to say that uh, a camp which has come up on the land of village Silgair has been sited there illegally when people protested, uh, they were fired upon and four people died. They're saying that under the constitution, this should not be allowed and that people should be consulted whenever anything is put up on their land or their land is used for anything. So the first thing I think uh, in my reimagined uh, India would be to go back to the basic principles um, in the constitution that Jaipal Singh and others fought for, the right for Adivasi communities to exercise autonomy in terms of their resources, in terms of their governance of uh, their uh, localities, in terms of their management of the forests, in terms of their management of their local resources. The second thing I think is very important is, as I said, education. And in my reimagined India, not only would we have lots of students uh, in Delhi University and other universities of this country and abroad, I would have them uh, be able to speak both in Spanish and in Dhurva, in Gondi or uh, Kuruk and in German. And this kind of education where they're able to combine their knowledge of the forest, their deep understanding of uh, their local environments with advances in botany, with uh, you know the latest that scientific knowledge has to offer.
That kind of education can only come if the government invests hugely in good quality public education, which is uh, sensitive to people's needs. So it should not be an imposition of the state language on these areas and it should not be uh, that they will only be you know learning in the mother tongue uh, which is usually defined by most states as the local state language rather than the Adivasi language but that they should have access to the riches of their own languages and cultures and to the riches of whatever else society is offering to uh, the middle classes and the elite. Uh, the third thing uh, that I think is in my reimagined India is the right for Adivasis to have the right to um, assert their own religion and their own culture and not have it subsumed by the majority religions that are defined in this country as the only religions worth listing. So Adivasis have been fighting for a long time to have their religion recorded in the census and it is true that classification in the census um, is a complicated question. There are many sects uh, in different religions which claim to be different, um, which are recorded as such. So there is no reason why, you know, Adivasi religion cannot be recorded as such, except a kind of supremacist idea that this is not a religion worth preserving. This is these are not languages worth preserving. So if you actually begin to understand any Adivasi religion and I can give you the example of Bastar where uh, there's a very unique religion which is based on um, clan on clan gods uh, and each of those gods have their own areas their, their own villages which are under them and uh, the gods visit each other just like humans do they're related to each other and they have a deep and intrinsic connection to the environment in which they are um, built and they are worshipped. So for instance, when the government wants to destroy the environment uh, through mining, when they uh, want to mine in Niamgiri or Baplimalli or Nandraj uh, in Deposit 13 in Beladila or Raoghat or Surjagad, they're not only destroying the local environment, but they're also taking away the local religion. What I haven't mentioned in all of this is um, the huge levels of um, poverty, the forced migration, the reduction in um, land ownership that we are seeing and the fact that there's a huge gap in the human development indicators between Adivasis and others. So of course the first thing is preserving their resources, preserving their land in order for them to have the same kinds of nutrition, uh, the same kinds of access to human development um, measures, health, education, etc. as uh, other people in this country. So we need equal citizenship for Adivasis. We need a differentiated understanding of the political structure which allows for difference. We need uh, religious freedom for Adivasis and linguistic freedom to be able to grow and prosper in the way that they want. Thank you.